cities of the Levites. Well, no. The the reason why I'm not teaching it verse by verse is it'd be silly to teach it verse by verse because it it made more sense. Obviously, the names of the cities. Some of them we don't even know where they are today. Some of them we do. Uh, the point is, it was a distribution, and it was a very specific, and that's what we'll be going through tonight. Uh, and that uh, God promised it, and it was going to happen. Uh, so, you know, the other thing that's important that we'll go through is is where the distributions occur and why they occur. Why does someone get 13 cities and someone get 10 and someone get 12? So, all right. But to the people in that day, they knew the city. Yes, absolutely. To them, of course, it made sense because they knew where they were. Right. Okay, so as a background to this, I want you to go first because you know how I love to move you from the New Testament to the Old Testament. So I'm going to go to the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Chapter 7. And I want you to see something that I think is important as we study this. 7, the last verse and then the first couple of verses of chapter 8. So verse 28 of 7. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 8. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has, taken his, who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. Okay? Now, we see that, of course, Aaron is the first high priest and other subsequent high priests oversaw a system set up by God that eventually would, is a, was a picture of what would be fulfilled in Christ, right? So that's what we're being taught in several chapters in the book of Hebrews. All of it was purposeful for the, Levitic, Levitic, the Levitical system and the use of the tabernacle, but its ultimate meaning, it was a picture for what would occur and be fulfilled in the New Testament in Christ. Now, Turn back from Hebrews to 1 Corinthians. Paul makes a very, I think, interesting comment. And I think the more you read Paul and the more we study these things in the Torah, you're going to see how much he comments on that's from the Torah. Even if he doesn't cite it verse by verse, which he often does, the, the images of it are constant in, in Paul's teaching. So 1 Corinthians 9, and we're going to read verses 13 and 14. So he says, uh, Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food at the temple? And those who attend regularly the altar have their share in the altar. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Mm -hmm. He equates the Old Testament system of priesthood and the ministry of, of the priests and, and ministry of the Levites. He equates it to the New Testament in relationship to the work of the apostles, the pastors, the teachers, and others. Mm -hmm. It's a equivalent old to new right here. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting passage, I think. So he makes a two-part argument, therefore, about the New Testament minister. He's analogous in some ways, but not always, to the Old Testament priesthood in his ministry for the church. Secondly, he, like the priests, have a right to be supported materially 
in their ministry. They could eat of the sacrificed animals. They could eat of certain offerings that came. They were allowed to do that. Paul's saying in the same way, the New Testament minister has a right similarly. And of course, Jesus said, when you go, don't take anything with you. Mm -hmm. Now, I've made this comment here. The analogy is taken too far in denominational groups that set up a literal priesthood system in their particular doctrine. For instance, the Orthodox, Roman Catholics, etc. Uh, the church is not national Israel. Okay? As much as we talk about the importance of Israel, the church is not national Israel, though its spiritual background comes directly from Israel. Okay? It's important to make that distinction. Okay. Now, in other words, the, the church is, does not practice everything that Israel practiced. The church doesn't have a priesthood. The church doesn't have what you mean nowadays? the church today, the New Testament okay. church. Okay, So it's spiritually, its background is Israel, and its, its fulfillment of Israel is in the church, ultimately, mm -hmm. in that sense. Right. But they're different. It's a different era for a different purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay? Make sense? Well, because the old system was a sacrificial system and it was leading up to Christ as a sacrifice. Exactly. Christ. So it was fulfilled. Mm -hmm. It was fulfilled. So they didn't need to go back. Correct. And this is why Paul is constantly in arguments in his, in his missionary journeys with what he called the Judaizers. Mm -hmm. Remember Galatians? Mm -hmm. He's always in conflict with the Judaizers because even though he's given the gospel, because they're Jewish, they say, well, we need to go back into the Old Testament system. And Paul says, no, you don't need to go back into the Old Testament system. Right. And so, circumcision was yeah, amazing. Yes. So now let's go to the book of Numbers. Since you're already in the New Testament, let's go all the way back to the Old Testament again. There's some very, I think, interesting things we need to see here. We'll start out in the first chapter of Numbers. Okay? Now, I want you to keep in mind, as we go through this tonight, how many times the tithe is emphasized and re-emphasized. Okay? Keep it in mind as we go through all these. So in Numbers 1, starting in verse 52, we read the following. And the sons of Israel shall camp, each man by his own camp, and each man by his own standard, according to the armies. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony, that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the sons of Israel. So the Levites shall keep charge of the tabernacle of testimony. So we see in this chapter and following chapters how God organizes Israel. And of course, they for 38 years, they're going to wander this way, going all around Saudi Arabia. But when they camp, when they march and when they camp, it's in a particular way. Okay? Now, we're, okay, you have a chart, I believe, that my wife provided here. Where you can see the diff We're going to talk about the different families of the Levites. Okay? Now, we see that Levi had three sons. They were Gershom, Kohath, and Merari. And you can see this, if you want to, in Numbers 3.17. It says, these then are the sons of Levi by their names. And it names the three. Okay? Now, of course, each one of these had families, and these families grew in size over time. So they became three distinct groups, the sons of Levi. Uh -huh. All right? There's a fourth, though. Aaron also had married, had children, had those children had children, those children had children. And so there also is a fourth group, the Aaronites. Okay, so, yeah, well, you'll see it. So 
they become, therefore, the priestly group. The Kohathites, the Gershonites, and the Merarites, <laughs> okay, are not the priests, even though they have duties in relationship to the tabernacle, okay? Only the Aaronites and their offspring become the priests. That's how it was broken down. Now, in Numbers 2, we, of course, we see how God assigned this special place for each one of these four groups around the tabernacle, okay? Uh, the, the, Gersh, the Gershonites camped west of the tabernacle. That's seen in uh, Numbers 3, verse 23. The Kohathites camped south, which is seen in Numbers 3, 29. The Merites camp north, Numbers 3.35, and the Aaronites, including Moses and his family also, camp to the east. That's found in Numbers 3.38. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, people have shown this. All the other tribes, okay, also had their place. They had places to the west, places to the north, places to the east, and places to the south. And if you look at them and how they were spread out based on their numbers, if you look down on it from above, what would you see? Cross. A cross. I don't think that's for no reason at all. Mm -hmm. God designed it as the ultimate fulfillment. It would be mm -hmm. all of this would conclude in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, the Levites did not get specific land. Therefore, they were called a tithe to the Lord. I want you to go and go to Numbers 3. And we're going to look at verse 12. Numbers 3, 12. Now behold, I have taken the Levites from among the sons of Israel instead of every firstborn. The first issue of the womb among the sons of Israel. So the Levites shall be mine. The Levites literally were a tithe to the Lord. And you see, God stated that every firstborn was his. Mm -hmm. That is, he was the one that had the right to the firstborn, not the mother and father. Mm -hmm. But instead of taking the firstborn of all 12 tribes, mm -hmm. he, chose one tribe. he chose one tribe and said, I'm going to do it this way. They will be, quote, my firstborn. They are the tithe of the other tribes to me. Wow. Okay? okay? Now, we're going to see how this plays out. Okay. Look also, if you would, at Numbers 341. In 41 it says, And you shall take the Levites for me, I am the Lord, instead of all the firstborn among the sons of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the cattle of the sons of Israel. So, now we're going we're to explore more about this concept of tithe. Now, in Joshua 21, we see the distribution of the Levitical cities. The Aaronites, okay, that is the offspring of Aaron and the offspring, I think, would include also of Moses, get 13 cities, specifically in Simeon and in Benjamin. That's where those cities come from. Therefore, the, the, the Benjamites and the Simeonites, in, the, in a very real sense, tithe those cities to the Aaronites. Mm -hmm. Now, the Kohathites get 10 cities out of Ephraim, Dan, and half of Manasseh. The Gershonites get 13 cities out of Asher, Naphtali, and the other half of Manasseh, and the Merites get 12 cities out of Reuben, Gad, and Zebulun. That's in chapter 21, how it's distributed. So each of those 13 or 12 or 13 cities were just tithed from, yes. from that? Yes, and I'm going to show you also why there weren't equal numbers. The reason why they weren't equal numbers is these, this tithe of cities is done proportionally. 
according to the size of each tribe's territory. It sets up the principle of proportional giving. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the final uh, conclusion of that, or what's the New Testament application of that? I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 16. Remember, it starts right out with this concept of proportional giving. The size, therefore, means how many occur. So in, in 1 Corinthians 16, now I just want second Corinthians. Here's something that Paul tells us, starting in verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save, as he may prosper, no collections will be made when I come. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. So what's he saying there? He's saying... Depending on what you earn... Correct. Right, how much... Therefore, the Christian who, quote, is a millionaire mm -hmm. is going to give more mm -hmm. than, the, than the one in poverty. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, I'm going to claim that everyone needs to in some way give, and I think I want to show you tonight the importance of that. But it's proportional, okay? It started out proportional in numbers. It continues its completion as being proportional in the New Testament. Okay? Now, the Levites, of course, received the tithe. The tithe was that every first animal, every first set of produce, actually, it's one out of every ten, actually, is the way it worked. And I'm going to show you how it worked. But 10% of what everyone made produced grain, corn, whatever it was, was collected and went to the Levites. And they, then they were to receive this tithe. Well, weren't they given land? They were given a small area of land to use. Actually, it was about 3,000 meters, 3,000 yards outside of their cities. They could grow a little bit or do a little bit there, but that's all they were given. To have animals. To have a few animals. Like, but it was quite small compared to... A pistol farm? Well, whatever. A garden? <laughs> whatever. Whatever. It was a small area that they were given around. Italy. Okay? Yeah. Now, I want, you to, I want you to see this importance of uh, the tithe. Turn to number. Go back now to Numbers chapter 18. I want you to look in Numbers 18, especially at verses 19 through 21. 18, 19, verses 19 through 21. All the offerings of the holy gifts, which the sons of Israel offer to the Lord, I have given to you and your sons, talk to Levites, and your daughters with you as a perpetual allotment. When did it end? Never. In Israel, never. It's an everlasting covenant of salt, which is a particular type of covenant they can make, a covenant of salt, before the Lord to you and your descendants with you. Then the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in the land, nor own any portion of that. They could use it, okay, that 3,000 mm -hmm. yards around. I am your portion and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. And to the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel, all the tithe in Israel, for an inheritance, in return for the service which they perform, the service of the tent in the meeting. Now, not only did they get 10%, but they got it in a particular way, which we're going to go into. Now, I want to talk more about this issue of the tithe. It's all through this chapter. It's all, it's all part of this principle. So let's start kind of in the beginning place. I'm sorry, yes. Um, you said here in the outline, uh, they also, when the Levites received their yearly 10,000, 10% tithe from the other 11 for their support, they, they gave a tithe of their tithe. Yes, yes. 
um, they give it to the high priest. Is that what they do? No, they would give it to the uh, they would give it well they give it to the Aaronites. The other Levites also the Levites, tithe. The, Levites. the other the Levites the high priest, so they'd be and his the and his family oh, no. and his family. Okay, ah. yeah, that's how it worked. The tithe was never optional; it was an obligation to all the Jews, okay, to national Israel, and and we'll look more at how it's done. Uh, because it's, it, God put in many properties to just keep human nature from taking over, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, now, there are additional offerings you could make. You, you didn't have to make additional offerings necessarily. There's lots of them you could well, make. There's a peace offering. Peace right? offering, grain offerings. Mm -hmm. You could make vow offerings. You could do votive offerings. There's all things. But the obligation was the tithe. But you couldn't just give offerings and not the tithe. You had to give the tithe. Isn't it amazing that God's idea of fairness, 10% was to take care of the government and the church? You know, having just paid taxes. Just <laughs> yes, yeah. I know. It was much more than 10%. But so when the Israelites said, give us a king, the family will go, not going to work out well for you. That's right. Right. You see and the effects of that even today that 25, 30% of our salary goes to the government. How many days yeah. of the year do we work for the government? Yeah. 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 And, of course, God made a minimal government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, therefore, it had to be minimally supported. Mm -hmm. And the bigger you make government, the more it has to be supported, and it never ends because we'll never get smaller government. Mm -hmm. So now turn to Leviticus 27. This is an extremely important passage, and I'm telling you, the principle of it applies to us. Okay, Leviticus 27, we're going to start in verse 30. Okay? No, I'm not there yet. I'm going to go with my pages. They're stuck together. Now, read this carefully. Thus all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If, therefore, a man wishes to redeem part of the tithe, he shall add to it one-fifth of it. And for every tenth part of the herd or flock, whatever passes under the rod the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. Okay, now what he means about passing under the rod. When animals, when a person produced animals, and it was time for him to pay up, he would march his animals through a gate system, and every tenth one, they'd have a rod that had some kind of dye or mark on it, and it would be marked. Ten more, marked. Ten more, marked. He did that with all of his livestock, everything. Mm -hmm. That was called being under the rod. Now look what he further says, okay? Verse 33, he is not to be concerned whether it is good or bad, <laughs> nor shall he exchange it. For if he does exchange it, then both it and its substitute shall become holy. It shall not be redeemed. In other words, if you cherry pick the system, mm -hmm. And you say, oh, well, that one really looks good. I think I'd like to substitute, a, you know, the scrawny one for the tenth one because I really could use that guy in my herd, okay? God says, you do that, you lose both of them to the tithe. You well, do not. Being sacrificed, used for sacrifice? Well, they, they were part of the tithe. They were, they were sent to the, to the Levitical cities, okay? All that went eventually to the Levitical cities. So. Again, God knows human nature, okay? Oh, yeah. Now, if you wanted to redeem part of the tithe, you could do it in some cases. In other words, if you wanted to get back, okay? If you say, well, I really kind of need that, but it happened to be the tenth one, you could in certain cases redeem it. But you had to redeem it by paying 20% more for it. And that money had to then go to the Levites. 
Like for instance, that, that little account is extremely precious to me when I keep it. But then I add additional 20% 20 20 for it. Okay, because again, you're buying, it back. you're buying it back. Now, here's the questions that are very important. A, based on what we just said, who owns the land? God does. Who owns the produce? God does. Who owns the offspring of all livestock? God does. Who is just borrowing it? Now, think about that and keep it in mind as we go further tonight. Who is borrowing it? Okay, I'm going to come back and ask you again later. Thus, why they were they required to tithe? It's all going to anyway. That's right. And we're going to look further, but tithing also taught them lessons. To keep everything in balance. Exactly. It taught them respect for God. It taught them that their livelihood ultimately was from God. It taught them to not grasp too tight at what they think they owned. Right. And things. To things. Mm -hmm. right. To right. things. Well, the thing when they think about it, because he allowed them to keep 90% of it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And one more question. Therefore, who owns the tithe? God, God does. All right. Now, keep those questions in mind as we go through this. Turn to Deuteronomy 14 from Numbers. Deuteronomy 14, and we're going to read verses 22 and 23. Okay. Here's where we get the answer for what are you to learn in a tithe. 22, you shall, you shall surely tithe all the produce from what you sow, which comes out of the field every year. And you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name. There was a time they had a festival when they bring the tithe to the Levitical cities, okay? The, uh, it, uh, it says, um, where did I stop? The tithe of your grain. Uh, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, the firstborn of your herd and of your flock, here's the key, in order that you may learn to fear the Lord, your God, always. Okay? Did this go back to where, when they were leaving Egypt, if they didn't have the blood on the doorstop, the firstborn of everything was kind of reminding them of that too? In a way, except that was, of course, a different application because it was... If you want, I guess you could say it was the judgment tithe of God on Egypt. If you want, if you want to think of it in a sense, okay. Not, you know, that I guess that's what you could say. Now, so, so, um, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Right. The word means um, awe, respect. Meaning respect and remember that yes. God is the one who owns it. Absolutely. And he's the one that allows you to have the 90%. Okay? But whose land is it? It's God. He gives the territory. He put them where he wanted to put them. All right? It's God's land. They use it. Got to keep that in mind. He would think if that's his land, it, it would be, you know, even kind of more logical for him to let people use like 10% and take the 90, but he actually did the opposite. Right. Okay. Drop down to, drop down to Deuteronomy, uh, the same chapter, verses 27, 28, and 29. You shall not neglect the Levite who is in your town, for he has no portion or inheritance among you. In other words, he's dependent on the tithe. Mm -hmm. And then this particular, I'm not going to go into this right now in verse 20, but at the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year. You shall deposit it in the town. And look at 29. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the alien... And the orphan and the widow 
who are in your town shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. So what's the other purpose of the tithe? You bless others, you are blessed. That's one thing, but... Those who are less fortunate. Exactly. Bound. Okay. That, that the point is that it also was charity. Mm-hmm. That there was a responsibility for those who had more to take care of those who had less. Those that truly were the orphan, truly were the widow, had limited means of producing income, et cetera, et cetera. Is that why we support all the aliens that arrive in our country? <laughs> yeah, well, like I, like I said, there is not a one-for-one equivalent in today's world for this. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Is, is this saying about size or charity? I'm sorry? I didn't have to hear it say it again. Is it? Is this saying about the the 10% or about the charity? It's talking about the tithe is also used for charity. Mm-hmm. In the in those cities, the, the, the orphan, the widow. Right, but tithe and charity, are they two different things or the same? Charity is part of the tithe. The tithe became the charity. Because I will when I, when I give 10% to God, but if I want to do the charity, I need to be above. Well, those 10%. That's that's a very, part of the free will offering. Obviously. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's free will offering. It, it could you're, be a, you're commanded to give the tithe. Right. But the free will offering is what charity. you decide. Charity. And we wouldn't have to give to charity if we were following these commands because they would be taken care of. Care of right. Time. right. Well, well, that's the way I look at it. Yes. I always right. thought that mm-hmm. there are two different things. Go back, go back now to the book of Leviticus. I want you to look at chapter 27. We're going to look at verses 9 and 10. Again, about human nature. Now, if if it is an animal of the kind which men can present as an offering to the Lord, any such that that one gives to the Lord shall be holy. In other words, it's a tithe. He shall not replace it or exchange it, good for bad or bad for good. For if he does exchange an animal for an animal, then both it and the substitute shall become holy. Now, God is serious about the idea, the tenth is the tenth. Okay. Don't play games. Don't cherry pick. This is your obligation. Now, I want to take these principles, and I want to talk about their specific application in the New Testament. Based on everything we've talked about in the principles and the attitudes and what we've seen about the tithe, I want you now to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I personally think that Paul had this fully in mind when he wrote what he wrote in 1 Timothy 6. Remember, he was a man of the Torah. 1 Timothy 6. We're going to start, let's read 6 through 19, and I want to talk, us talk about this. All right? But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Keep the idea of contentment in your mind. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. And if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with a pang. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness." 
fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you have been called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in the unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, be rich in good works, to be generous and be ready to share storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Now you think about the spirit of what he just said and think about how so many people donate things to charity. What do they donate? Stuff they don't want. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we call that donation? Yeah, right. That's... Get, ludicrous get, for the, get it's ludicrous for the Christian. I'm not saying you can't donate. I'm saying the mentality is ludicrous. Right. To take the worst of your worst, remember what you had to take, take the ten and put them under the rod, to take the worst of your worst and give it is not charity, mm-hmm. not in the spirit of what we're seeing here. Mm-hmm. Okay? To say amen to that, the choir that Kate Gatlinburg, a year and a half ago or whatever, Many of the Rotary Clubs in Tennessee got together and had a distribution of clothing, food, furniture, whatever. And they literally hauled off dozens of truckloads of rags. I think tons. Yes. I mean, hundreds of truckloads of nothing but rags. They sold them for rags, and they, but people donated them for things for people to wear. But you're right, they were rags. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's and of course it's a it's a miserable mentality. The other thing that's a miserable mentality is this: the churches in America are built around the 5013C IRS code law that your donations are tax deductible. I'm telling you, that's a terrible idea. Okay, because it gives you the idea that you get a benefit from giving. Right. It's a terrible idea. You know, you should not care about your giving. You should not care if it isn't 5013C. You should give it to who needs it, even if it doesn't go through the conduit of 5013C. I think it's terrible to limit ourselves to that idea, and I think it's not in the spirit of giving. Well, I think churches do all kinds of things that may not be right to hold on to that, yeah. They do, mm-hmm. and they're going to get in deeper and deeper trouble as the government becomes like more corrupt like too. The church won't even um, marry in their church. Did you hear her say that? Their their minister won't even marry have married in their church because they're afraid the gay people will want in there. Our church is that way. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I think it was mine. Let me assure yeah. you, this is going to get worse dramatically. It's going to get worse. If you look at what's going on in California, which almost always moves to the east, you see now the really persecutory attitudes in the legislature that are going on about Christianity. You know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's horrific. And, and one more thing. In Canada, for instance, let me give you another example. You cannot preach the gospel openly anymore or you can have a you can be charged with a crime because it's anti-Muslim. You are absolutely restricted in Canada. The churches will be dead in Canada because of the government. The government has invaded the churches. The government has invaded the churches. You know, and the thing that the churches need to do in this country is not open the door more for the government invading more. You know, 
There's a place in which the churches should stand up and rebel against those things the government mandates that are not in the spirit of Christ. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, and if it costs them their 5013C, they cost their 5013C to do the will of the Lord. I'm sorry, but I feel yeah, yeah, in this right. spirit very strongly about that. They were also in the news about the kids, a lot of oh, yeah. In California, they have... Canada, was Canada too. In California, they mandatorily teach every child from kindergarten now about all the transgender, transsexual, uh, all the different types of, of sexuality, homosexuality. It's mandatory. You cannot exempt your children in California from it. You cannot imagine how much jokes are there in the Internet in Russia so. about that. We are, co we are collapsing our culture. Oh, good luck with that. You know, it's kind of, the animals know whether they're male or female. Right. There's not any question. <laughs> but but I, like Suna like said once, honey, remember you said, when there is a gay couple, they, uh, like, unconsciously, they, they just choose male and female roles in it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Because this is human yeah. instinct to, to have this. How, how, how do you think it's a spirit that comes on? The point is that it's a design. It's, it's the design, design. design. It's the design in Genesis 1 and 2, and even though so like they, they try to corrupt it, they cannot get out of the design. They right. still want to roll. Right. Okay? Right. This is not a statement about persecuting homosexuals. I'm not, you know, that's not what I'm talking about at all. But homosexuality... If it is pervasive and is taught so aggressively that it now is practiced by a large, let's say, let's say it's even practiced by 20% of the population, it's not at this point, but if it was, it is the death of the culture. Mm -hmm. What's you, that saying? Well, it's the death the because you perfect. cannot produce enough people to Pop, repopulate the culture, the culture will die. That's the bottom line. And that's the satanic strategy. Mm -hmm. Just because Satan is so jealous because uh, God gave man the ability to the reproduce. Ability to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the Muslims don't believe in that, so they're going to be pro Of course. <laughs> and interestingly <laughs> enough, all of these principles in Islam, okay, the mistreatment of women, the ability to beat your wife to a certain extent, it's all through the Quran. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's clearly there. You can't avoid it. But who speaks out against that? Do the feminists speak out about it? No. Do the Canadians speak about, about it? No. Do the Californians speak out about it? No. They take up for it. They take up for all these principles that are mistreatment of other human beings. But it's protected. It's satanic. And now, movement are all victims. <laughs> now let's <laughs> let's go through. Okay, let's go through this First Timothy six sixty nineteen, and I want to pick out six things that it teaches. It, it'll te it teaches more than those, but let's go through the six. Okay, first of all, most important point, starting in verse. Uh, Six, the goal of all about giving and wealth and the accumulation of wealth is to accomplish contentment. Mm -hmm. Contentment literally in the Hebrew, I'm sorry, in the Greek means, the, it would mean as a paraphrase, I have enough. I have enough. That's the concept. I'm thankful for it. I have enough. Okay, Francis Schaeffer used to talk about when he was preaching and teaching and writing in the 70s, 80s, about in the Western world, the accumulation of, of material things. And he says, the two moral prerogatives of the West have become the accumulation of wealth and personal peace. In other words, leave me alone and let me accumulate and do with my stuff what I want to. That's the two overriding principles that our culture has developed, and not Christ-like. 
So, contentment, I have enough. Secondly, I'm putting it this way. Remember he says, we, have, we, take, we bring nothing into this world, therefore we can't take anything out of it either. I'm, I've made this statement. Money accumulated and placed in the coffin does not prepare us for life in heaven. <laughs> right. Chinese don't think so. Yeah. Oh, really? They put paper money in the, in the yeah. coffin. Oh, really? Well, they're going to be sadly <laughs> mistaken one day. Okay? Yeah. All right? Now, people will make this argument. And frankly, I'm telling you my personal opinion. I'm, my, I'm identifying it as my personal opinion that it's a mistake in many cases. And that is, well, I've got to accumulate this all because I've given it to my children. I have seen children ruined by receiving inheritances. They almost always squander the inheritances on themselves. I've seen it time and time and time and time again. Especially the extremely wealthy. Well, but I've seen it in the middle class. I've seen them, you know, get get inheritance money, use it foolishly, squander it away. Because they, didn't because, it. they never earned it. They never learned how to earn it. Look at me. That's right. That's right. Perfect. Well, through and through. Or third principle. The drive for wealth is never satisfied and therefore leads to moral corruption, evil desire, desires, and bad effects on other people. Have you ever watched someone that's greedy negotiate anything? I find it disgusting. You know, they want to cheat the other person down to the smallest way they can, get everything they can out of them, and then they're in glee and happiness because they've screwed the other guy. That, How many movies are out like that, too? Well, I mean, it's really so How many people do it every yeah, day in the business yeah, world? This is all about what I'm saying is that entertainment, that's, you know, happy. That's business in this country. It's business in this country. Let me see how much I can get over in the other guy. You know, and there's no such thing as any purchase, okay, economic contract that isn't win-win. It can't be win-lose. Both parties must gain something in the process. It's the only biblical way to do it. But it's constantly violated all over. Fourthly, last statement. Last statement. You said I said the biblical principle of contract is really built around the idea that it must be a win-win. There's an equivalent for an equivalent. I gain something, you gain something. There's a fairness involved in it. It's not a win-lose. It's not I cheat you out of something for my benefit and screw you into the ground. Right. So when it's the equal, both receive, that's godly? There must be some mutual benefit to it. Some mutual benefit. Okay? Right. Good. All right. Good. Fourth, the real goal for us in relationship to money and material things should be the growth in Christ-like character and the real currency mm -hmm. of heaven is our deeds, not money. Okay? I'm not going to necessarily go through this with you, but please read 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 16. It's a story about the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? Every one of us will go before that judgment seat. God will be of no, have no interest in what your car looked like, how big your house was, what your IRA had it, your Kia or your 401k or whatever. He doesn't care. Okay, we're in heaven. Okay, what it's eternal. Like Those things that we see. The point. The point of First of First Timothy six is: What good can you do with what you have? That's the whole point. What good can you do with what you have? How can it accomplish eternal purposes in life? How can it lead to better things in the lives of other people? Uh, that's the whole point. It's the fruit of the Spirit. In our culture, so much is tied to money. Mm -hmm. Success, mm -hmm. whether you're successful or not. Power. There are many, many things. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, well, the point is we're imbued with the idea of money. Okay? 
in this culture, we are imbued with the idea of money. What and we, can you do with money? Exactly. And the, in our culture, people have the attitude that it's my money, it's my house, it's my car, it's my cash, right? That is not a Christ. Well, go back to what? And who owns the tithe? Mm -hmm. Who owns the land? Mm -hmm. Who owns the produce? Okay? That should be our mentality. You know? It's God's. Now, we have to live. God, I mean, clearly, in that, he gives them the 90%. Yeah. says live on it. But it's all with the mentality of, I, you got it from me. Yeah, like I was generous and allowed you to have it. Like someone said, if you are, if you cannot be happy without this thing, then you will not be happy with it. Yes, exactly, because it'll become an idol. Mm -hmm. But in yeah. our culture today, what well, everybody? I mean, I've got relatives just because I'm well off. They want what I have without working for it. Of course. You know, so there has to be, and God it, blesses us no. if we plant the seed and we get out there and work and no. he gives it. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not, this is not statism, okay? This is not Marxism. This is not socialism, okay? Because, again, go back to everyone works mm -hmm. and it's proportional giving. Mm -hmm. That means some have more. Some have a medium amount, and some have less in terms of income. God never discriminates against that. Matter of fact, he repeatedly says something that Karl Marx apparently never understood. The poor you will always have that with you. you. Yeah. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, he says that. Well, because the that puts the one mic has in the place, that's all he has. Poverty is not just a problem of having not enough money. It's much more complex than that. And that's why if you only use money to try to solve it, it doesn't work. Well, okay? it probably is about the, like never had enough. Well, never satisfied. Well, never it's in the mind. Never 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 poverty never is in the mind. Yeah. And poverty is in the lack of character, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? Now, some people are impoverished for reasons they can't control. Right. If you get a million-dollar bill because of some unbelievable surgical procedure, mm -hmm. you can't really help that, okay? And therefore, you know, you're impoverished by it, and it wasn't really your choice. But there's plenty of reasons why people are impoverished, because they do stupid things with money. Or don't want to work. Or don't want to work. They had, uh, like, the, every seven years, like a bankruptcy. Right. You can start all over again. Yes. Your people you owe. Well, actually, it was 50 years. 50 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One no. more yes. law in the law of sowing and reaping. Yes. And I'm going to use this example real quickly. I was in Michigan, my office, second floor, and outside the office in the spring, there was a pair of robins building a nest. And I, every time I looked up, uh, one or the other was coming in and building. I looked about 4.30, and both male and female were sitting on the ledge absolutely exhausted. Mm -hmm. And the thought came to me, there's no welfare in the yeah. animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. If they don't work, they don't survive. Mm -hmm. And of course, Paul taught that also in the epistles. He says, you know, you're supposed to work to provide. There's no question about, you know. He does parasites. True. No. Who are feeding from on others? From, yeah. yeah. But yes, that's why they're He who doesn't work shall not eat. Shall not eat. Yeah. So the, there's a balance principle. I love that very well. <laughs> yeah. There's, it's a balanced principle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, f fourthly, okay, fifthly, I'm sorry. And please listen to this. Riches are uncertain. They come and go, both in personal cycles and in historical cycles, okay? If you watch, if you even go back to the history of the United States over the last 240-some years, you will find that there are repeated cycles of impoverishment that occur. 
You have depressions all the way through the 18th century. You have some that occurred in the 17th century. Of course, we know the famous one in the, in the 20th century. There were those, it was about seven or eight cycles of them. You can plot them, and they are, amazingly occur about every 60 or so years. It's very interesting if you plot when they occurred and see when the next one happens. Therefore, we will not escape it. It's a cycle. It's like climate cycles. It's like the sunspot cycle it is a cycle. It has to do with human nature and how human nature ultimately creates cycles in these things. In the same way, personally, okay, we can all go around and tell stories about personal cycles. You guys have clearly talked about personal cycles you went through where you lost just about everything. Other people have lost large amounts of money, okay? People have gone from having a lot to being impoverished. People have gone from, on paper, having huge numbers on stock markets, and stock markets crash, and where are they, okay? We can't depend on accumulated wealth, okay? It's not permanent. It comes and goes. What we can depend on is what God tells us in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. If the birds of the, of the air are fed, if the lilies of the valley grow, then why are you worrying about what you will eat? Doesn't God care about you more than the birds or the plants of the field, right? He personally says, I will guarantee your basic needs. Not wants, not accumulated wealth, not your 401k or anything else. But he does clearly say that. But so many times it's not how I want it to be supplied. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, we all go through that. Too. Okay. Great. You know, I, I will I will say this. You guys have said, talk, talked about what happened to you years ago, okay? You know, you know, all of you probably know what eight years ago went through a divorce, okay? No. <laughs> I lost an enormous amount of money. I lost almost entirely my retirement. I lost half the value of my house. I lost, I mean, I lost two inheritances of my family, okay? Now, honestly, for a year or two, that really made me angry. It really did. It seemed enormously unfair. And in, I guess in the justice sense, it wasn't, okay? You know? But I'm glad it happened. I'm glad it happened, okay? Because I don't depend on my, I mean, I, I had a lot of accumulated wealth, and I don't depend on that. I depend on week to week what God provides. That's what I have. And God provides it every week. Mm -hmm. Amen. The bottom line there is to rely on what God, about God, and that's the thing that Mike and I learned the most, you know, mm -hmm. that we weren't using God or leaning on him or praying to him or needing him or anything, you know. So therefore, God, and he, God is trying to get our attention. Yes. Finally, he did. Yep. Very dramatic. Yeah, very dramatic. Good. That's a good, that's a good yeah. yeah, attention. So, but, you know, and now we are very tuned in to God. Yeah. You know, and then all the different things. Okay. Have you ever wondered about the story of the rich young ruler? Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. When, and I really think I found a clue in Josephus' writing. If you look what happened when Jerusalem was circled and under siege, they were literally robbing each other inside, trying to collect the gold. Right. And those that were lucky enough to escape, many times they would swallow the gold oh. and try to get it outside the gates, and then the mercenaries outside would literally bet them to see if they had any gold in their stomach. Mm -hmm. When Jesus said to the rich young ruler, go sell and give to the poor. 
I really think he was saying, if you do that, you will live. Because a few years later, Jerusalem was under siege. If he had that will, he got killed because of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Over a piece of metal. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't that Jesus absolutely needed his money to finance a new jet plane. He was coming, you were going to die for that money. It's the heart. It's the heart. Yeah. yeah. Right, the heart, and what right here at the beginning was you know, being content yep. with what you have or don't have. Yep. Okay, sixth. Riches for the purpose of blessing others, which leads to real final rewards. Mm -hmm. The reward we want to see is the reward we get for the growth of our character in Christ, where we hear on the final day, the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. Okay, I gave you this, and you did this with it. Mm -hmm. Ten got ten. Five, five. One, one. It was proportional, mm -hmm. but each was required to use what they had for good. Mm -hmm. Even though they didn't all have the same thing. So... Now, go ahead. I want you as an assignment, and it's going to be in your quiz next week. Okay. okay? Don't worry. I want you on your own to read 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 14. On your own. And I want you to think and pray about it. And I want you to ask yourself and ask the Lord how this applies to your own life. Okay? So. No. It's not. You'll, you can read it and see what it says. But I think it's something that, you know, we have to concern ourselves about. So, anyway, do you see in this the principle of the tithe? Okay? We don't, we're not national Israel. We don't take one of every ten of our tomatoes in our in our raspberries and our strawberries and take them to the Levitical cities, okay? But the principle of tithe is based on the idea that it's the Lord's land, the Lord prospers, the Lord owns the tithe, okay? And we need to see it not as ours, but it's a loan. It's a loan. Well, that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were, you know, down every little seed. And, yeah. And then they For the wrong reason. Yeah. And then they wouldn't take care of the Pharisees. Yes, exactly. The uh, government has, has stolen from us, really. Yes. And the churches have. Yeah. And you think yes. the churches so have? Yes. They're paying out like 30% of your time. They're paying about 30 if you started to calculate what you pay in total taxes, real estate tax, sales tax, tax on gas, federal income tax, you're probably lucky, lucky if you get 40%, 50% of, of what you earn. Each one will give an account of himself before our Lord. Exactly. All right, let's stop.